first American blimps had served in the Great War. Afterwards, the non-rigids took a back seat to the giant rigid airships used as fleet scout. But the world's great powers lost several expensive rigid airships. The War Department had used Army blimps for coastal patrol, but then the funds to modernize the Army airship fleet were denied. So the Army contributed its equipment to the one remaining Navy airship base. The Navy had also bought the old Goodyear Defender and called it G-1. It was 1939 before the Navy tested the new Goodyear 404,000 cubic foot K-2, but the Navy had only trained about 40 LTA officers in the previous decade. Inexperienced crews punctured the big blimp in Lakehurst Piney Woods surrounding the base. By the time K-2 was reinflated, Europe was at war. Pamphlet demonstrating how a few rigid airships could patrol vast sea frontiers was released late in 1941. But the airship Macon, whose scout planes could have detected the Japanese attackers a thousand miles from Pearl Harbor, had been lying on the ocean bottom for six years. The Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company's advertising fleet barnstormed Depression-era America and were familiar sights over cities and county fairs. But war clouds were billowing. The isolation was not to last. America would soon need all her sons who could learn to utilize nature's gift of helium because the blimp would be going to war again. The application of buoyant flight for the U.S. military purposes had by 1937 shrunk to a handful of Navy officers and men based at Lakehurst, New Jersey. Only about nine Navy officers had been blimp qualified in each year since the armistice operating the old J-4, the fuel gas powered K-1, the ZMC-2, and Goodyear's G-1. When the Army was denied further LTA funding, the entire inventory of U.S. Army airships was transferred to the Navy. The proud history of Army LTA quickly faded into obscurity. Only the early 30s blimps, TC-13 and 14, were inflated as Navy airships. Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company had perfected a 123,000 cubic foot blimp design and had built several examples in the 1930s. The Navy ordered one copy, designating it L-1 in April of 1938. L-1 tested its sea refueling and even sky blue camouflage coloring. Beginning in 1935, Navy master airship conceptual artist C.P. Burgess called for an experimental airship to the old K-1, so-called K-2. Goodyear's H.R. Liebert led the non-rigid design team to fill in the details of the new large patrol airship. The final car design, returned to the old Zeppelin style of command pilot, 
directing the rudderman and the elevatorman and team specialist. The 404,000 cubic foot K2 was delivered late in 1938 with a payload capacity of almost three tons. The new airship was the first Navy non-rigid designed for helium. American helium had been promised to safely lift Zeppelin passengers after hydrogen had been blamed for the Hindenburg fire. When Hitler marched into Austria, the helium was quarantined in the port of Galveston. Just before Hitler invaded Poland in September of 1939, the Graf Zeppelin II performed one last military service, sampling British radar transmissions using the World War I spy basket. The LZ-130 was harassed in Scottish territory by British planes. The peaceful luxury liners had no future as Hitler's armies overran Poland. Hated by Reich Minister for Air, Goering, the Graf Zeppelins were dismantled and their hangars demolished. The world's only remaining rigid airship was considered too old for service. In the way, the ZR-3 was dismembered. Scrapping the USS Los Angeles delayed any hope of sky ships operating with the fleet. Some officers pushed to utilize what they could get. Former skipper of rigids, Captain Charles Rosendahl, published an influential article praising the blimps of World War I. Finally, as part of the 10,000 plane program in 1940, Congress authorized no more than 48 non-rigids. Lakehurst became part of war planning. Practicing with Submarine Squadron II, Lakehurst officers pounded out the first anti-submarine tactical manual as President Roosevelt's Lend-Lease Plan gave England 50 destroyers in exchange for use of land in British colonies. Roosevelt wrote that the blip situation amused him, since the Navy was now working for the small airships he favored all along. The Navy organized neutrality patrols to look for potential belligerents. The old J-4 ultimate evolution of the Great War would finally retire in 1940 after 18 years of service. It was the last Navy airship capable of alighting on the water. The unique old ZMC-2 was dismantled for use as a training aid. Hybrid K-1 was moored out. It was decided to purchase Goodyear's Ranger, another L-type, and build four new copies of the 1937 K-2. But when Germany, Italy, and Japan signed the Tripartite Treaty, the U.S. Navy had only five blimps. Goodyear's Ranger put on the L-2 designation only to have inexperienced crews puncture it in Lakehurst Pines. It took months to reinflate the L-2 and more time to deliver L-3. Navy Secretary Frank Knox drew up new basic plans which called for new airship bases near Cape Hatteras, in South Florida, at Los Angeles, and Puget Sound. Sunnyvale was to be reclaimed from the Army, and the old Cape May base would be reactivated, but Cape May's World War I hybrid hangar was so badly corroded it had to be dismantled. $12 million was allocated to establish two eastern locations, Construction began at South Weymouth, Massachusetts, and Elizabeth City, North Carolina. Each would receive a shortened steel replica of Akron's famous air dock. Concrete foundations were followed by 2,000 tons of steel arches, 190 feet high. The distinctive slipstream clamshell doors were also duplicated. The nation's only airship manufacturers started making four new K-type airships. The World War I hangar at Wingfoot Lake was employed as Goodyear hoped the Navy might exercise its option for two more K-type airships. The 1936 design's high fuel consumption was addressed with lighter Curtis Wright 424 horsepower engines equipped with gearboxes. To keep the unit cost down to $325,000, there were few changes made from K2 besides more helium for greater lift. The new K-3 arrived at Lakehurst in September 1941 as the Nazi U-2642 attacked the USS Greer. After 11 sailors were killed when the USS Kearney was torpedoed, sister ship K-4 and K-5 followed. 
On Halloween, Nazi torpedoes ripped into the USS Reuben James. These bold attacks on neutrality patrols revealed the vulnerability of even high-speed surface craft designated to fight submarines. The Navy ordered 21 more copies of the available K-ship design. Isolation seemed impossible. President Roosevelt warned the Nazis we would start shooting back to protect shipping in our territorial waters. Yet, on December 7, 1941, the attack came from behind. History's most infamous attack was possible because the Japanese task force was able to approach undetected within 200 miles of Pearl Harbor. Nearby, Iwa's mooring mass was still waiting for its long-range scout airship when bombs fell around it. Two dozen submarines encircled Oahu. Summary dismissal of local commanders, Admiral Kimmel and General Short, there was no question of buoyant flight in the western frontier. Not even one barrage balloon, long since proven in Europe, protected our battleships at Pearl. December 19th, a Japanese submarine brought the war to America's doorstep by torpedoing the tanker SS Emilio off Eureka, California. On the 23rd, the SS Montebello was sunk off of San Simeon. Suddenly, the West Coast was the front line. Another ship was attacked off Oregon. Shortly, the I-17 would launch its plane against Los Angeles and shell an oil refinery near Goleta. Operating from her little hangar, Goodyear's advertising ship Resolute began patrolling Los Angeles Harbor like a privateer, armed only with pilot Art Sewell's hunting rifle. The ship was repainted as L-4. Her crew, including R.H. Hobensack, were quickly enlisted in the Navy and sent back out on patrol. The Navy commandeered Goodyear's Enterprise to become L-5. Reliance became L-6 and Rainbow L-7. Serial number NC-10 did not become a replacement ranger as expected. Instead, it was shipped to California to become the L-8. Bomb racks were quickly added and armed patrols began. The little L ships brought comfort to nervous harbors. Sunnyvale became a Navy LTA base again. As the Army pulled everything out, two of their old ships, TC-13 and TC-14, arrived as the only long-endurance airships on the West Coast. This ragtag band formed ZP-32, the West Coast Patrol Squadron. Commanding Officer George Watson established expeditionary bases at coastal Watsonville and Treasure Island to protect San Francisco. Back at Lakehurst, Blimp Patrol Squadron 12 was formed with four 1940 K ships under Lieutenant Commander Raymond Tyler. The veteran L's G1 and K2 remained under station command. Japan's ally, Nazi Germany, had now declared war on America. Suddenly, the United States was involved in a two-front conflict in which no nation had ever been victorious. But no other nation had been blessed with helium. German commander of undersea boats, Admiral Karl Donitz, could muster only five submarines to carry out his plan of attacking shipping along the Northeast American coast. All his campaign a roll on the kettle drums. And what a drum beat it was. January 11th, 1942, a campaign of terror began as the Nazi U-123 torpedoed the steamer Cyclops, 300 miles off Cape Cod. More U-boats arrived in the coming months and to join in the slaughter. In the second period they called the Happy Time, the Nazis torpedoed, shelled, and rammed unescorted ships silhouetted against the brightly lit coastal cities. Searching for the elusive raiders, patrol airships flew hundreds of hours each month. Lakehurst L ships were first armed only with radios to call for support. No U-boats were within range of Lakehurst, and the Nazis were encouraged by the disorganized defenses. The sinkings escalated. The Navy increased its request to the authorized 48 airships, making the K-type the most mass-produced airship ever. 
the Bureau of Mines' only helium plant at Amarillo, Texas, was producing 10 million cubic feet per year. 48 airship strength demanded more lifting gas. Another plant was added to extract the helium-rich natural gas from the vast fields of the Lone Star State. More tank cars were manufactured as America's railroads transported the only practical antidote for gravity. Operational doctrine called for the long endurance airship to find the needle in the haystack, but to attack only after the submarine submerged. If found on the surface, the radio operator would call in for air support or slower surface craft to attack the radar. German intelligence warned their boats by February that Luftschiff's airships would be encountered over certain locations, and in March, a U-boat captain noted an airship in his log. 1916, alarm! Medium-sized airship support. Three depth charges at 10 minutes interval. Six, but no damage. Made up at high speed for Bebo water. Under ideal conditions, a submarine could be seen in 60 feet of water. 2035 hours. While scanning the horizon, I discovered an airship on the port beam flying a zigzag course. Because of the clear blue water, I did not like the airship, which would soon be over me. I turned tail and went to deeper water to lie on the bottom. The easily spotted blimps caused the Nazis to be more concerned with their own survival. 1858 hours. Alarm. Airship. Crash dived while airship turned toward me. The merchant marine came to appreciate having airships around. This vessel was attacked while under Corvette and destroyed us for but never under blimp protection. Only then that Goodyear engineers delivered K-7, first with 50 caliber machine gun turret installed. If the airships were going to be more than just guard dogs, more than just eyeballs alone, we needed to find submerged subs under everyday conditions. Veteran K-2 had carried light sensing equipment to develop coastal blackout procedures. Now the super secret Operation SAIL program used K-2 to help adapt detectors derived from the drilling and mining industry. Sensing a distortion in the Earth's field caused by submerged object, magnetic anomaly detection, or MAD gear, showed promise. The sensor was mounted on the hull forward of the car and the chart recorder gave a readout by the navigator's table. MAD was effective if a low-flying airship passed directly over a submarine. If the scrolling chart showed a signature, a smoke bomb was dropped and another pass was made to determine if the object was moving. But early MAD gear hastily added to K-ships was erratic and unreliable, finding more shipwrecks than subs. Meanwhile, off Oregon, a Japanese submarine shelled Fort Stevens, the first fire on a coastal fort since 1812. Down the coast, B-25 bombers were crammed onto a Navy carrier as the first mission against Japan's home island departed the Golden Gate. Patrol blimp L-8 became a cargo ship as former Goodyear pilot John Riker delivered vital bomber parts to the crowded deck of the USS Hornet. Jimmy Doolittle's raiders went on to boost American morale with the daring 30 seconds over Tokyo. To obscure the airship's capabilities, designation letters and numbers were blotted out. Orders also came to paint out the tricolor stripes on the blimp's tail surface. On the foggy San Francisco morning of August 16, L-8 pilot Lieutenant Ernest Cody noted his wet airship was heavy. To compensate, mechanic J. Riley Hill was given the day off. Unfortunately for Cody and co-pilot Ensign Charles Adams, no mechanic tending the leaned engines may have caused carbon fouling. Both men may have lost their lives hanging outside trying to start the hot, stalled engines. Minus the crew's weight, L-8 rose past pressure height and blew helium through the safety valves, the hull lost its rigidity. Drifting home alone as a free balloon, it snagged on a telephone pole in Daly City. Well-meaning rescuers ripped the bag and found no one aboard. The equipment was intact and fuel remained. L-8 was given a new envelope and quietly returned to service, but the mystery of what happened to her vanished crew has become legend. 
Back in the Atlantic, U-boats carnage continued as the Nazis capitalized on inadequate cooperation between Army, Navy, and Merchant Marine. Some nations put U.S. ports off limits for their ship. Armament was doubled as external bomb racks were fitted to the new K-ships, but the tanker Persephone was sunk even though patrolling blimp K-4 was a few miles away. Criticized for their lack of coordination, department officials were compelled to accept the proven British convoy techniques. Merchantmen would be grouped in rows of five or less to present fewer flank targets. Many of the long endurance airships would change their mission from patrol to escort, following shipping south to North Carolina and north to Massachusetts. The incomplete bases near Elizabeth City and South Weymouth could be utilized from Lakehurst so crews could follow a convoy going in either direction. With their steel hangars well underway, each of the new bases commissioned one squadron. ZP-14 formed at the North Carolina base, now named Weeksville. Likewise, ZP-11 at South Weymouth, Massachusetts featured one blimp on loan from Lakehurst. The three light squadrons formed the first airship patrol group commanded by Captain George H. Mills. The new interlocking plan had the airships take on the role of shepherd of the convoys, trying to ward off U-boats and keep merchant ships in line. Blimps helped merchantmen make safer rendezvous some 50 miles from port. Some old ships had no radios and had to be herded in line with flashing light signals alone. Often the airship's command pilot was designated SOPA, meaning senior officer present afloat. But there were too few airships and too much ocean. The situation was beyond grim as two or three ships were being sunk every day. Bodies washed ashore as helpless civilians watched the attacks from oil-stained beaches. The 1942 nightmare became unbearable by June. The Nazis had sunk a record 16 ships in five bloody days. Finally, Congress issued a blank check. 200 airships of any type were authorized to be built. It had come at a terrible price, but the nation finally would realize its unique helium asset, the only practical solution to the open ocean search problem. Goodyear's team was contracted to start building a modern blimp and would update the ZRCV for production. New bases would be built to allow airships to range over the entire seacoast of the United States. Since rigid airships were to follow, hangar design was based on housing a 10 million cubic foot airplane carrying rigid. With American steel plants at wartime capacity, a sudden demand for 2,000 tons of steel for each of the 18 proposed hangars, like those going in at Weeksville and South Weymouth, was out of the question. By fall, a Bureau of Yards and Docks team, led by Ashen American, had developed a design 1,000 feet long, nearly 300 feet wide, and 180 feet high. Concrete floors were poured with helium and air supply lines. Rising up from the concrete foundations were 24-foot high footers, provided shop and office spaces. American foresters answered the call as timber was substituted for steel in the largest free space wooden structures ever conceived. The Timber Structures Company was instrumental in supplying this gargantuan undertaking. Massive Douglas fir beams were treated with fire retardant chemicals and joined with ring connectors. To cover the shipping lanes beyond Jacksonville and Charleston, a station was established near Brunswick, Georgia. 
Miami, and the South Florida Straits would be guarded by the Richmond Naval Air Station. The Mississippi Delta would be protected by Homa, Louisiana. Hitchcock, Texas would guard the port of Galveston and shipping beyond the Rio Grande. Santa Ana would cover busy Los Angeles and Long Beach. The nation's Pacific Northwest would be protected by Tillamook, Oregon. At many sites, contractors used tower-mounted cranes. Others used massive wooden traveling scaffolds to erect the arches. All sites had to contend with coastal weather. In the north, snow loads had to be considered. Tillamook was often so foggy and wet, the crane operator and archmen could not see each other. And it snowed there that winter for the first time in 30 years. In the south, hurricane resistance was part of the equation, and Hitchcock was storm damage even before it was completed. In Santa Ana's earthquake-prone country, it was strong desert winds that twice toppled the arches during construction. An army airplane crashed and became entombed in one hangar column. 200-foot high inverted catenary arches were placed every 20 feet. The arches were supported with an intricate web of connecting trusses. Stairwells led to 137-foot high catwalks running the entire hangar length. Finding enough manpower was the universal problem. Some of the men building Glencoe came from 300 miles away. The steel hangars at South Weymouth and Weeksville would each be joined by one wooden hangar. But the Douglas Fir plan for Weeksville was unavailable, so a local contractor substituted Southern Pine. Instead of waiting for shop time, the arch components were constructed on the Weeksville site. Homer was in a floodplain, so a levee had to be built around the bayou base. Overcoming poor soil conditions, the Homer contractors completed this largest wooden structure ever built, more than a fifth of a mile in length. At Homer, wooden semi-dome doors 127 feet deep prevented dangerous wind pileup as effectively as the steel clamshell doors and earlier air docks. Seven main meridian ribs 13 feet deep formed the doors, while 17 wheel trucks carried the weight across 11 concentric tracks. Eight horsepower geared motors moved the office building sized wooden structures through a complete cycle in about 10 minutes. The complex semi-dome doors were not needed at other sites where better soil allowed construction of 147-foot concrete and steel columns supporting 20-foot square box girders. The cantilever spans prevented wind loads from pressing the wood arches as their doors were opened. Six 27-foot wide panels, each 120 feet tall, would interleave pulled by cables run by 10 horsepower geared motors. Door cycles took about two minutes and created a little airflow problem. The door design did consume 60 tons more steel than the wooden semi-dome type, but would prove more reliable. The distinctive Horton sphere was the most obvious feature of each helium plant installation, but every manner of equipment required by lighter than the air force had to be created in quantity. Overshadowed by the enormous sheds, each facility would need barracks, mess halls, administration, and support building. Lakehurst and Moffitt both were to receive two of the new timber behemoths. It would take over a year to complete all these huge support facilities, but each new base demanded brigades of trained men immediately. Pilot training began with practical lessons in aerostatics using hydrogen-filled balloons. Cadets, many drawn from the Navy's V-5 recruiting program, would learn to control a buoyant vehicle subject solely to the whimsy of the wind. They would come to appreciate how a moment's tug on the gas valve or a handful of sand tossed overboard dramatically affect the small balloon's buoyancy. After a solo flight, 
the student was better prepared to deal with airship engine failure. All this background work was unseen by submarine raiders, still plying their trade of destruction on the high seas. When U-432 threatened a large convoy of war material, K-3 appeared. 13, 12 hours, in periscope, airship came into sight, which shortly afterward passed right overhead and forced us to dive deep. 20, hours, dived again to 40 meters on account of airship. The K-Type's huge window did allow a wide view, and the methodical blimp could carefully eyeball anything suspicious. Airplanes, which always had to move forward at high speed, sometimes wasted bombs on seaweed or existing wrecks mistaken for U-boats. A U-boat running from a blimp could not train its torpedoes on a target, but convoys without blimps were not so fortunate. Airships acquired an additional mission as U-boat victims drifted at sea. The blimps had begun finding survivors early in the war, radioing for rescue boats and lowering supplies. Soon, rescue provisions became standard mission equipment. On the 7th of July, 1942, an army bomber stumbled on the surface U-701, quickly attacking and sinking the raider. Blimp K-8 from ZP-14 found some of the crew still afloat days later, summoning the Coast Guard to capture the German. The airship, while a beacon for rescuers, could hardly hope to sneak up on a surface U-boat. The K-ships would have to get smarter. A new short wavelength radio detection and ranging, or radar, was developed using K-6. Soon, a second electrician filling the position of radarman was added to all K-ship crews, making night patrols practical. Then the K-5 helped perfect an underwater radio microphone. Dropped through an aft tube, the expendable sonobuoy helped detect submarines by their noisy propellers. K-5 proved the microphone could hear a sub at three miles and its tiny radio could broadcast back to the monitoring blimp some five miles away. Rushed into production, the sonobuoys would supplement the short-range magnetic detection gear. Navigation over trackless oceans had been based on dead reckoning until K-2 carried the bulky prototype automatic direction finder, or ADF. An antenna looped around the envelope would help the airshipmen navigate. Meanwhile, the Goodyear Aircraft Corporation was suddenly swamped with more orders for K-types than all other Navy airships combined. Women came to play a major role in mass production of the K-type airship, the Kingship. Goodyear's balloon room would be Akron's envelope headquarters. A blimp began as three plies of different weight rubberized fabrics which were cemented together with alternating bias. Twelve rectangular doors were joined together fore and aft as stitches were maintained at six to eight per inch. Seams were taped and rolled to prevent leaks, then overlaid with 85 longitudinal panels and end caps to form the K-ship envelope. Workers prepared the scores of heavy fabric patches, cable mounting points, and other fixtures to be sewn and glued into the envelope. Reinforcements resembled a flat hand with fingers extended. Subassemblies were built elsewhere. The Akron Gymnasium was changed from barrage balloons to a thin fabrication facility. The Dunlop Rubber Company also made envelopes. Openings for gas and air valves were double reinforced at the edges, providing an entry for inspectors. Bright lights would reveal any defect against the jet black interior almost as well as the sun did once the envelope was inflated in the field. Air bladders inside the envelope, a French innovation called ballonets, were made of lighter gas type fabric. The layered fabric sandwich only amounted to about 20 ounces per square yard, but assembled, the new 425,000 cubic foot helium bag weighed about seven tons. The world's most unique assembly line, now Goodyear's Plant C, added a second shift to build the airship's core element. 
chrome molly steel tubing was welded together into a skeleton containing 11 mainframes. Owl clad aluminum sheets were riveted to the channels, then applied to cover the framework. Diamond grid deck plates covered balsa and spruce planking on removable floor panels. Gasoline tanks and air valves were mounted up above. Pratt and Whitney 425 horsepower engines were mounted on outriggers that doubled as air scoops for the balinese. The oldest blimp hanger in America was doubled in size as Goodyear started inflating a new king ship every month. Fins were wire braced to the envelope as inflation began. A sandbag net managed the big balloon as workers moved the weights down one diamond at a time. The car assembly was rolled into place and its load cables connected to the catenary curtains inside the bag. A simpler external suspension carried about 15% of the load. In the tight quarters above the car, the ballonet ductwork was connected and valves installed. Controls were strung with tension springs to allow the big balloon to expand and contract without loss of control. Most of Goodyear's original pilots were now in uniform. New company men took each new blimp out for a test flight before delivery to the Navy. Company technical representatives supplied expertise at remote bases. Each location had its own unique problems. Other challenges were universal. Improved mission availability meant more long boring patrols over featureless oceans, sometimes punctuated by frantic attempts to chase down and bomb a quickly disappearing contact. Blimp crews longed for the day when they could prove they had bagged a sub. They had no way of knowing U-boat captains were becoming more aware of their buoyant adversaries. 2000 hours. Took bearing on Navasar Island. A Zeppelin stands watch. There was no word like blimp in their language, but some captains were familiar with the so-called Percival semi-rigid airships used in advertising back in Germany before the war. 15, 15 hours. Dived. Airship. Difficult to make out since clouds were of same size. It passed over a possible bearing inscription U.S. Navy. We pursued convoy, hoping to service sooner or later. 2,100 hours. Amusement at first caused by appearance of airship or skipping away to a certain amount of respect. Zero, 230 hours. Surfaced. No point in pursuing convoy. Batteries are nearly exhausted. Avoiding a blimp was more difficult than hiding from a passing airplane, and the King ship posted the most on-time availability of any airborne weapon system of the war. Blimp escorts succeeded in keeping U-boats submerged with their mobility greatly reduced. Batteries would be quickly run down if top speeds of seven knots were maintained. By forcing a U-boat crew to change its objective, a single airship could save many surface vessels, but few people on shore would notice. A convoy of watchdog duty brought comfort to sailors, but would never make headlines or earn medals. Advertisers rarely used blimps to endorse products as they did racy planes or powerful tanks. Then, just as now, people did not realize that a vessel saved from destruction with its precious cargo intact would be worth far more than a sunken U-boat. Our Canadian allies sent an officer to Lakehurst who became convinced his country should operate K-type airships. The Soviet Union, also operating airships, asked for Goodyear blimps. Refused, the Soviets built their own hydrogen inflated version. Back at Lakehurst, the airship found a continuing role as research and development vehicle. Innovators tried mounting a 30 caliber machine gun in the aft window. The expendable weight problem was addressed with the scheme to catch drag weights during a landing. And other tests examined dragging a bomb to troll for submarines. 
Another idea required a blimp maintaining a loitering hydrophone station using a fuel-saving sea anchor. The old J-4's anchor rig was adapted to the G-1 for promising tests supervised by Lieutenant Frank Trotter and Lieutenant Commander Clinton Round. Rounds was flying some scientists in the L-2 the moonless night of June 8th. Underwater flares capable of exposing a U-boat were being tested. G-1 flew alongside to record the test. Flying without lights, the two airships collided and their entangled wrecks took 12 men to their deaths. Only Ensign Fahey, who jumped clear of the suffocating fabric, was saved. But with Trotter died the driving force behind the sea anchor. Tests on K-5 were delayed for months and its problems were never solved. But many more L-ships would be ordered. It would become the Navy's primary training blimp. Some L-cars were built by the flexible bus company. G-1 had given birth to a new G-series, which became the intermediate training airship. G-type cars were built by the twin coach bus company. The Battle of the Atlantic had claimed 400 ships, but new blimps were now being delivered at the rate of about one a week. In September, near Miami, Naval Air Station Richmond came online. With it came Squadron ZP-21, featuring brand new K-ships 17, 18, and 19. Richmond headquartered Captain W.E. Zimmerman's Airship Patrol Group 2. To relieve the tiny L-ships and aging Army airships at Moffett, K-20, K-21, and K-22 were flown across the mountains to join ZP-32. The old TC-14 was put out to mass testing snow removal techniques. K-ships were being manufactured faster than they could be erected. Every third car and bag was packed and shipped by rail to California for erection in the USS Macon's old air dock. The K-23 was first to be inflated in California. The Japanese, determined to bomb the American homeland in answer to Doolittle's raid, sent aircraft carrying submarine I-25 to set fire to the Pacific Northwest. Slipping past scattered defenders, the aircraft's bombing raid was a failure thanks to soggy conditions, but fear of panic kept authorities from revealing the attack. There were about 40 submersible aircraft carriers where that one came from. Finally, the two new Pacific stations came online. Santa Ana welcomed the King 23 to inaugurate ZP-31. Tillamook, Oregon was dedicated on December 1, 1942. Brand new Kingship 31 arrived to start up ZP-33. It would be several months before the new squadrons would be at full strength, but patrols began immediately. Pioneer balloonist and rigid airshipman Captain Thomas G.W. Settle would become first commander, Fleet Airships Pacific. America had been at war for a year. There were only three dozen king ships, while the Axis operated ten times as many submarines. But America was catching up. To meet the demands of the growing lighter than Air Force, the task of training pilots, crews, and maintenance personnel was divided between east and west coast. Goodyear Field representatives supervised the creation of L ships on the west coast. Some 22 L ships were used to instruct cadets in the fine art of navigating an advanced motorized balloon in the wind. Some enlisted men advanced from blimp crew to pilot in the expanded training program. World War I instructor Jack Botner took charge of training a new generation of blimp pilots. Former rigid airshipman and submariner Captain Don Mackey took command of Moffett, now designated the primary training site. 
Mechanics, electricians, and riggers receive classroom instruction and on-the-job training. Early on, the only available training manuals still taught rigid airship fundamentals, even though ZR-3 was no longer a training ship. Moffitt instructors developed their own training courses and manuals. Once there were competent pilots, experienced mechanics, and trained riggers, there was precious little time to train a blimp crew together as a fighting unit. Singer Bing Crosby leased property near his Del Mar racetrack to the Navy for one dollar. Working with American subs out of San Diego, K-ship crews gained experience with real submarine contacts. Lakehurst provided advanced training. In the new G-ships and older K-ships, students practiced dropping ordnance on U-boat mock-ups in the pine scrubs. Later, training was conducted in the deep waters off Key West using World War I American and Free French submarines. With the arrival of King 41, a new station filled the Southeast Gap as ZP-15 began operating at the Georgia station named for Glen County, Gunco. As more King ships came into service, advanced bases with only basic facilities were established between hangar locations. The many expeditionary sites, manned by squadron detachments, offered further flexibility, helping close the gaps in what would become known as the helium umbrella. ZP-32 set the detachment halfway to Tillamook at foggy Eureka, California. The 47 King ship was set up right where the first Japanese sub had attacked. One morning, K-47 left Eureka for a routine patrol. Radioman Simon Beatty got a mad signature before the airship was ready to head out of Trinidad Inlet. Pilot Peter Ace Culbertson attacked with K-47 death charges. After a few hours, another king relieved them and bombed the now stationary contact. That evening, witnesses reported diesel odor and debris washing ashore, and the men of ZP-32 detachment were sure they had bagged a pig boat but there was no mention of the action when 47 piloted by skipper R.E. Bly gave Navy Secretary Knox a tour of San Francisco Bay. As the K numbers passed 50, it became possible to extend the airship coverage into the Gulf of Mexico. King 53 came to Homa, Louisiana to start ZP-22. K-54 was named Jean Lafitte when ZP-22 crews assigned their ships pirate names to patrol the Mississippi Delta area. Further west, Hitchcock, Texas, gave a home to ZP-24 as Kingship 60 and Kingship 62 arrived. 24's blimp crews ranged south to the Rio Grande using a mass base at Brownsville. Now the Nazi subs were in the warm waters of the Caribbean using Nazi sympathizing Vichy French Islanders for fresh food and even fuel. In answer, ZP-23 was formed at Hitchcock, headed south and established headquarters at Vernon Field, Jamaica, sharing a field with U.S. Army bombers. ZP-23 airships also covered southern Central America with help from ZP-21 blimps looked for both German and Japanese submarines from stick mass near the vital Panama Canal. To pursue the raiders even further south, king ships were deployed to the South American continent. ZP-51 was activated in the British West Indies. Another thousand foot long hangar was planned for headquarters on vital Trinidad. Instead of waiting, the 80th Navy Negro Construction Battalion was employed to re-erect the old Brooks Field Army blimp hangar that had been disassembled and moved in from Texas. It was the first time Eleanor Roosevelt visited an LTA facility. Carlson Field became home to Airship Wing 5. Care had to be taken to avoid overflying neutral Venezuela when patrolling in the Trinidad area for fear of internment spreading coverage into South America, ZP-51 established Detachment 2 at Edinburgh Field, British Guiana, alongside Army bombers. 
taking care not to overfly German sympathizing French Guiana. Detachment 3 set up at Paramaribo Field, Dutch Guiana. Soon blimps were guiding vessels around shoals and protecting shipments of war critical bauxite ore needed for aluminum production. Now U boats spotted blimps in the Caribbean. 11.43 hours. Dived on seeing airship take off with riding lights on. It was bombed by the airship while at periscope deck. On 26 April, K-45 dropped its ordnance on magnetic contacts and scanned for results. Suddenly a U-boat surfaced directly aft. With bombs expended, K-45 could only call for help. But in the seven hours it took for a destroyer to arrive, the Nazis escaped. Zero, 120 hours, Havana in sight, at Severin of starboard bow. It turns and has inductive detectors. We need our 3.7 centimeter gun very much right now. The summer of 1943 saw a record number of Nazi subs sunk by surface and air units as new listening stations were able to detect U-boat transmissions. The command of Fleet Airships Atlantic, now Commodore George H. Mills, urged his crews to be more aggressive. No blimp had been credited with a sub kill because diving teams were not available to verify action against submerged targets. Likewise, workers building K-ship cars rarely received the satisfaction of seeing their handiwork roar off and do battle with the enemy. On Independence Day 1943, Goodyear workers assembled outside the air dock for a morale-boosting ceremony. Lieutenant Joy Hancock of the Waves, herself twice widowed by the rigid airship program, was on hand to christen brand new K-74. As the new blimp joined ZP-21 at Richmond, Florida, their cheering send-off proved to be strangely ironic. It was that morale builder, K-74, that got a radar contact on the night of 18 July. Command pilot Nelson Grills ordered battle stations. Radioing for support was fruitless. K-74 tried to remain up moon as she approached the contact. Soon the blimp crew could see U-134 heading right for two merchant vessels coming down the shipping lane. Crewman Eckhart opened fire with a 50 caliber machine gun. Passing over the radar, Ordnanceman Stessel pulled the bombing levers. It's not known if the bombs exploded at the 50-foot settings, but U-134 was one of the first subs to be heavily armed against their attacks. Its 20-millimeter guns riddled the blimp, flaming an engine. Attacked at night by a Navy airship with bombs on cannon. Main ballast tank 5, quick diving tank on starboard side damage. K-74 settled into the water and crew abandoned ship. K-74's attack so damaged the radar that it was unable to submerge. Limping home, it was sunk by a bomber. But Stessel was lost to a shark attack before K-74's crew was rescued. In October, K-94, flying off Puerto Rico, seemed to be in mortal danger, and the B-25 was sent out to investigate. Both the blimp and the bomber went down in flames with all hands. If the U-518 in the area at the time was victorious, it did not survive to tell the tale. U-boats were soon equipped with radar detectors. Many times a blimp's number one electrician would report a radar contact, only to have it quickly disappear. Always searching for more unprotected targets, U-boats had been raiding below the equator. ZP-41 was established to pursue the Nazi south. Former Goodyear pilots R. H. Hobensack and Preston Dixon leapfrogged five countries and on 26 September their King 84 became the first non-rigid airship to cross the equator. It had taken 98 hours to fly 4,430 miles by chart and dead reckoning. K-88 and others soon followed. ZP-41 set up shop in San Luis, Brazil, established bases at Amapá, Agarapé Asu, and Fortaleza. Crews at remote mass sites had so mastered the art of keeping the blimps in the air with minimal facilities, another thousand-foot hangar laid down in northern Brazil was canceled. 
The U-boats attacked even further south, and ZP-42 was created at Maceo, Brazil, flying down to Rio, K-90, and others patrolled out of Ipatanga, Caravelas, and Victoria. Blimps became familiar sights to the girls on Ipanema Beach. In the distant south, tables were turned on the Germans as the U.S. airshipmen commandeered the giant hangar at Santa Cruz that had once housed the Graf Zeppelin and the Hindenburg. Using ladders and equipment that once maintained the giant rigid airships, ZP-42 created the Navy's southernmost airship overhaul and repair facilities, sharing the hangar with Brazilian allies. Crews were told to avoid nearby Argentina. Duty with the ZP squadron was something like ordinary aviation duty. Former sports heroes, then in uniform, might sign autographs. USO shows occasionally made it out to the remote sites. When the movie star visited Brazil, the K-100 was dubbed Alona Massey. Her husband served in ZP-51. Crewmen stood round-the-clock pressure watches to verify envelope fullness as the barometer rose and fell. If not blessed with a hangar's fan and air duct systems, a gasoline blower would be hung outside to maintain air pressure. But no matter how long the crews worked, the squadron could be awakened at any hour to ground handle an airship. Most every base had a mascot, often a mongrel dog. Keen to the sound of running engines, some dogs would run out and catch the blimp's line in their teeth. Local civilians were often employed, and locals were often beneficiaries of off-the-record blimp services, from spotting schools of fish to ambulance service. Pilots experimented with increasingly heavy takeoff weights, squeezing out more endurance for patrol and escort. The U-boat attacks dropped off as airship missions increased. Rough weather could toss the big blimps around like small boats in heavy seas. The smell of gasoline and rubber permeated everything. The noise level was high, so off-duty crew heading aft could use the head, but found no quiet to enjoy rest in the bunk or seats. The small galley allowed crewmen to double as cooks. At some stations, the chow was not too bad. Keeping overgrown motorized balloons in fighting trim was not much like turning wrenches on an airplane. Work stands were rigged to permit engine repairs while blunts swung at their mass. The fabric gas bags were occasionally punctured, but sometimes it took heroic measures to save a ship impaled or wind slammed against a hangar. Occasionally, even the low and slow flying blimps, which kept the schedule even when birds were grounded, would slam into a fog shrouded obstruction. The big bag absorbed many impacts that would obliterate an airplane. Accident summaries showed an above average safety record. Without realizing, blimps listed as wrecked would usually be repaired to fly another day. Powered by high octane gasoline, the ever present danger of fire waited for lapses in proper procedure to claim an airship. When static electricity or improper fuel dumping started a fire, even 400,000 cubic feet of helium wouldn't smother it. Some sailors lost their lives in this way. Fire hoses were used to snow off of blimps at frigid sites. An airship could be damaged by the weight of tons of ice accumulating on the bags and fins. Sometimes dragging a line across the top of the bag would not loosen the ice. Many a freezing night found gallant sailors fighting Mother Nature for their ships. Conversely, in the tropics, fire hoses were used to cool the superheated bags to prevent their overpressurized helium from being wasted through safety valves. With airships deployed over many climates, Mother Nature was occasionally successful in overturning a mast or plucking a K-ship off its moorings. The giant hangars offered hurricane refuge for local airplanes. One tremendous storm blew over Louisiana into the Gulf where it drove one of ZP-22 patrol ships above pressure height and then dropped it into the drink. One by one, its crew drowned in the heavy seas. Only Ensign Feast was rescued. 
Back at home base Homer, strong winds managed to jam one door partially open. Eventually, the pounding winds pried open the other end, ripping three blimps loose. The K-56, 57, and 62 were wrecked when bombs exploded. Power lines were struck and fuel ignited. In the south, blimp squadrons, or blimp runs, were challenged by the corrosive effects of the tropics. Patches came unglued, and balsa wood nose battens disintegrated. The K-56 was lost when its upper fin brace rotted off in flight, but a gentle landing allowed a crew to escape. Goodyear and Navy engineers responded with improved patching, metal nose battens, and anti-corrosion techniques. As flying hours increased, wear and tear on the hardy craft found squadron crews flying by day and maintaining their ship by night. A major reorganization brought welcome relief by creating headquarters squadrons, or hedrons, which took on the major maintenance duty. Since more overhauls required more hangars, several stations were expanded. NAS Richmond became master of the South Atlantic, receiving a third 1,000-foot-long hangar. The increasingly complex case ships could not lift full military loads in the muggy Amazon conditions where pressure height was as little as 100 feet. An improved 456,000 cubic foot envelope was developed. But the 1936 design was just about stuffed full of equipment and weaponry. After a year and a half of war, there had been enough time to create a modern pressure ship. By fall, veteran airship designer Carl Arnstein's masterpiece, the M-Ship, was taking shape where the flying carrier USS Akron had been built. The Mighty Mike was a modern, innovative design, spreading its load more evenly along its 300-foot envelope. The 117-foot-long car consisted of three flexing sections. The 625,000 cubic foot M1 was rolled out in October. On Navy Day 1943, the M1 was christened by Mrs. Jean Rosendahl. The Mike 625,000 cubic feet of helium could lift enough gasoline to carry eight depth bombs to mid-Atlantic. The Navy had ordered 22 of these most capable craft. However, U-boat proponent Donitz now commanded the entire German Navy, which employed bigger and tougher submarines. Equipped with the new snorkel device, the sub could run its diesels while submerged. These new German boats were heavily armed against aircraft, and some would shoot down more planes than torpedo ships. But the U.S. Navy now operated the largest fleet of helium-borne vehicles in history. There were five airship groups called wings, for lack of a better term, each under the command of a captain or commodore. There were 15 operational squadrons with 6 to 12 airships each, performing a variety of missions around the clock. The 10 major hangar bases were supplemented by more than two dozen mass sites operating patrol and rescue coverage spanning 3 million square miles. Americans had endured two years of war, and Navy lighter than air was at last at full strength. With the helium umbrella extending around coastal Americas, there were fewer places the submarines could ply their trade of death without being molested. Submarine lookouts cursed the blimps, sometimes hard to see amid the gray clouds. Every time I raise my periscope, an airship is still. World War I blimp pilot Captain Carl Lang was skipper at NAS Tillamook when two king ships assisted in an I-boat sinking off Oregon but the report was classified for 50 years. Off Brazil, a K-ship tracked a sub and called in a bomber, which sank it, but the blunt crew was never given any credit. When a U-boat crew returned with an airship sonar boy, German intelligence must have realized the submarine had no practical way of detecting an airship, unlike the surface vessels whose screws they could hear. 
While anti-submarine tactics were increasingly successful everywhere, U-boat attacks around coastal America dropped off dramatically as the airship value came to be appreciated. It is not known how many submarines were made mortally vulnerable or sunk by blimp action. Since airship attack was limited to submerged submarines, victory could only be verified by divers which were not available. But the war's unsung heroes were the ever-present escort airships reporting for duty before dawn silhouetted the convoys against the horizon and warding off harm long after dark. There were stories of threatened mutiny among merchant seamen when blimps were unavailable to shepherd their convoys. Blimp escort is the best sort of protection. It beats all other. While they were the bane to Axis boats, our own submarines appreciated blimp assistance during shakedown and training. The hovering airship reported on dive performance, telltale bubbles, and noisy maneuvering underwater. Prepared and sometimes given safe passage escort through our own defenses, U.S. subs went on to be highly successful against the Japanese merchant fleet. Innovative blimp crews found even more ways to be helpful. Time and again, airships located wrecked airplanes and led rescuers to helpless victims. Airplanes often crashed in remote areas where no rescue party could reach the survivors. After locating one wreck, pilot Lou Ayers set his K-65 down on a remote island to rescue the grateful airmen. For this, Ayers received the air medal. Occasionally, twin-engine bombers on extended ferry flights ran out of gasoline that enabled them to remain airborne. Sent out over impenetrable jungle, an airship would hear Navy blimp, Navy blimp on their radio as thankful survivors saw the big bag as their rescuing angel. Sometime, an LTA crewman would organize a hold-down party from survivors, or a blimp crew would hold its own short lines. Where there were large numbers of survivors or salvage was required, K-ship relay teams would execute the recovery. When impossible terrain would not allow a wheel landing to rescue a dying airman stranded in the California desert, pilot Pete Culberson crash-landed his K-95 to take aboard three men. K-95, her props bent, eased back to an army base where the victims were hospitalized. Two-bladed props were borrowed from Army airplanes, and she returned to Santa Ana. Culbertson received the Distinguished Flying Cross. Sometimes blimps were positioned as lifeguards when airplane pilots trained over water. Least they drowned when gravity claimed their heavy machines. But it was over water that the K-ship rescuers could not be equaled off the California coast. Ensign Laurel Baez maneuvered K-59 so his crew could lower a harness out the door. A bleeding victim was saved by the first sea-to-airship rescue of the war on March 3, 1944. Innovative airshipmen utilized a pulley above the aft door and rigged a breeches buoy. Then a man in the water could be hoved aboard. Now an airship arriving at an accident scene could not only lower a raft and provisions, but could actually collect the victims themselves. At sea rescue became part of the routine. A counterweight was added through the wheel well to lessen the pull. Individual rigging came to be standard as word spread among commands. When the new M2, M3, and M4 joined the fleet, they added greater capability to the rescue effort. In the final count, at least a 1,000 people owed their lives to airship rescue. Navy airships rendered 25 different types of assistance. Later king ships were equipped with aft opening clamshell doors, making towing rescue possible. K ships actually dragged small distressed vessels to safety. Exhausting its fuel, chasing a U-boat, K-68 was stranded on a Caribbean desert island. High winds led to her deflation. Sister blimps helped rescue one of their own. The K-68 would be rebuilt to patrol again. And K-90, downed in a horrific tropical rainstorm, 
was dug out of the jungle as shipmates ferried supplies. The constant demand for photographic overview, test torpedo chasing, and endless smaller tasks also needed airship support. Airship Utility Squadron 1 was commissioned to answer this need. Utility 1's G and K ships quietly performed many vital support missions from chasing down loose barges to calibrating Army radar installations. As the war reached its production peak, buoyant vehicles tested everything from British hydrophones to new scatter bombs. Veteran K-2 carried the bulky prototype long-range navigation or Loran gear. The nation's foremost airship proponent, Rear Admiral Charles Rosendahl, became chief of the Navy Airship Training and Experimental Command. The K-91, having survived a pre-detonating scatter bomb with Admiral Rosendahl aboard, later tested a seven-foot-long, 680-pound acoustic torpedo that could home in on its noisy submarine enemy. Building a new airplane carrying, rigid dirigible still eluded its proponents, but adding a utility aircraft to a blimp would have enhanced its mission capabilities. Goodyear proposed a million and a half cubic foot O ship to carry an airplane. A Piper Cub named Glimpy was flown under the M1 in a series of experiments to test the idea. The hitchhiker was then released to fly home alone. Meanwhile, Rosendahl had lobbied to get airships overseas, but a practice D-Day landing found U-boats still torpedoing Allied warships off England. When the call finally came for blimps to help crack Fortress Europe, little preparation had been made. ZP-14 was chosen to become the first in Europe. The 100th Kingship, K-101, was among the six chosen to make the unprecedented deployment across the Atlantic. Leaving South Weymouth, two ZP-14 K ships used secret Loran navigation gear that sister Ks had helped to develop. Masts were set up at Newfoundland and the Azores. They reached the Azores in 16 hours. Then, loaded with over a thousand gallons of gasoline each, the two ships flew for 21 hours to reach Port Leote, French Morocco. K-109, K-112, and others soon followed. Inspired by their success, K-114 and another ZP-14 ship would cross the Atlantic via Bermuda in the Azores, a total of 3,530 miles. Squadron equipment was transported to North Africa and ZP-14 set up headquarters at Port Leote. Improved MAD sensor heads mounted opposite on the hull for better port and starboard target resolution arrived just in time. Their installation would be the first of many actions ZP-14 crewmen would perform under challenging conditions. The Africa Squadron had its share of action and adventures. As Allied troops landed at Normandy, K-123 established a nighttime magnetic detection barrier across the Straits of Gibraltar. No Nazi vessel would ever pass again. A patrol base was set up on the island of Malta. Lieutenant Gordon Bodak's ship, the Flying Mayor, was a hit with senior British officers. An advance base was set up on Sardinia, blimps becoming familiar sites to local farmers. One ship was christened Minnie the Miner as ZP-14 carried French officer observers and helped clear the waters. Nazi mines in operations Trump and Topiary. With Mussolini defeated, ZP-14 established a presence in Italy. K-101 shared a Roman field with army planes. Operating from Venice and Pisa, K-ships directed minesweeping operations to make Italian ports safe again. At Bizerti, sailors turned the tables on Il Duce while occupying an airship hangar other Italians built to fight the Turks. In 1912, ZP-14 proudly escorted President Roosevelt through the Pillars of Hercules and onto Yalta. When Allied troops liberated the French port of Toulon and Marseille, ZP-14 occupied the old French rigid airship base at Kurs. 
Freshly captured German prisoners were employed working on the old doors. POWs grabbed the blimp's line, helping dock the first airship without a mast. Cures became the Weeksville of the Med, complete with Goodyear representatives. Equipment built for servicing German Zeppelins now maintained Navy blimps. Meanwhile, back home, squadrons competed for unbroken patrol records as the average case ship worked 256 hours a month. The giant squadron ZP-21 flew every day from November 1943 to 15 May 45. That's 965 consecutive days where at least one ZP-21 airship was on guard 24 hours a day. Each blimp was on the ground for replenishment for as little as two hours each day. Commander Vincent Astor's program for equipping fishing boats with radios paid off for ZP-11. On the 2nd of July, K-14 was dispatched to investigate a fisherman's sighting of a periscope off the main coast. The U-233 was laying mines off Bar Harbor. K-14 found her and attacked with depth charges, but U-233 fired a volley which struck after the car and burst out through the top of the envelope. The two combatants had badly damaged each other. K-14 hit the water hard, and owing to a new door safety catch, several crewmen didn't escape. The next morning, crewmen were discovered clinging to the floating bag. A few weeks later, K-25 spotted a 370-foot U-boat in shallow water off Chatham, Massachusetts. Attacking, K-25 blew a hole in the sub just after the conning tower. The largest U-boat ever made had been single-handedly defeated by a U.S. Navy airship, yet the details of the two combats were kept secret for 50 years. The blimp's stable platform was invaluable to motion picture cameras, and ZP-21 blimps had helped film Florida Keys set for a Pacific Island landing movie. Finally, Hollywood decided it was time to tell the airship story. This man's Navy featured a reserve commander, Wallace Berry, playing a chief petty officer who deployed with his blimp squadron to India. Hollywood crews worked at Lakehurst for weeks as the Navy supplied veteran K-2 for film duty. Santa Ana was used. Del Mar was dressed to become India. The movie wasn't just dreaming about using airships against the Axis in the Far East. German U-boats had joined their Japanese counterparts for deadly hunting in the Indian Ocean. The Axis partners were trading technology and vital raw materials with giant cargo submarines. ZP-14 skipper Emmett J. Sullivan dispatched officers to examine the old Karachi facilities. While the giant British rigid airships had never reached India, the facilities could have been adapted to blimps and support Indian Ocean operations. The U.S. Marine Corps barrage balloon squadrons had reached Numea, but the Japanese were using LTA in the North Pacific. Launching firebombs with small hydrogen balloons, they considered employing biological weapons. A blimp detachment from Tillamook was established in northern Washington after a balloon bomb killed several civilians. The Japanese also launched thousands of floating mines to harass our fleet. K-60's alert crew saved the new carrier, USS Gilbert Island, from hitting a Japanese mine. American submarines were suffering heavy losses to Japanese mines in the Sea of Japan. Some officers realized the blimp would be an ideal mine-spotting tool, but even the new M-ship could not cross the vast Pacific. Perhaps a blimp could be refueled from a flat top. Such a daring stunt had not been tried since the days of the rigid Los Angeles. In February 1944, Lieutenant Buzz Lloyd piloted K-29 out of Santa Ana to the escort carrier Altamaha, training off San Diego. No one was sure how this would work. Each vehicle would be moving in its own medium, but the test went well. While crewmen held the blimp lines to the carrier's cleats, a simulated fuel transfer was performed. 
By August, K-111 had demonstrated 72-hour endurance by rotating crews at 12-hour intervals off the carrier of Nakasar Strait. Eleven kingships were ferried out to California, and Mike's followed. Yet despite not seeing Japanese submarine success rates in the Indian Ocean and the mines in the Pacific, blimps would never fight there. Meanwhile, Brazilian President Vargas stopped into ZP-42's headquarters and made an inspection flight. Brazil decided to establish its own buoyant air force, and 40 men were sent to Lakehurst for training. Some of the aristocratic pilots thought their batmen should execute control commands. But the U.S. Navy had already begun to discount the need for bigger and better airships. There would be no ZRCV and no O-ship. M5 through M22 were canceled. When the KE-135 arrived at Lakehurst, remaining production went into spare parts. After France was liberated, the Nazis were still sending U-boats out of deep Norwegian pens. On the 5th of May, 1945, U-553 sank a Kalia off Rhode Island. The K-16 and K-58 located the raider the next morning, dropping depth charges to help surface units finish off the last submarine attack on American war. The Nazis hoped to wreak havoc with midget submarines. Blimps were repositioned as rumors about suicide submarines persisted. Intelligence warned of the new high-speed electric boat to be deployed from the still operational Norwegian submarine pens. To checkmate the remaining Nazi subs, Lieutenant Commander H.B. Van Gorder was ordered to take ZP-42 out of Brazil and redeploy four airships to southern England. Arrangements were made to use the giant hangars built for the R-100 and the R-101. In May 1945, German Admiral Donitz ordered his submarines to strike their colors. The crews waiting in England packed for home as ZP-42 ships were turned around. Surrendering German subs were escorted into American ports under the watchful eye of air shipmen. ZP-14 blimps were retained in the Mediterranean through 1945, when the British requested their expertise to continue mine-sweeping operation. Operating from 30 bases on three continents, blimps had escorted more than 80,000 vessels without a single loss. The Navy's LTA wings had been aloft some half million hours, flying about 58,000 missions. Of some 860 operational U-boats, some 750 were lost to Allied efforts. We shall never know how many were defeated by airships alone, but we must never forget that a vessel saved with its precious cargo intact was worth far more than a sunken U-boat. No airship deployment came in the Pacific before the atomic bomb finished the Japanese dreams of empire. Airships escorted the victors back to American shores the blimps had guarded so long. The war destroyed some 20 airships and with them some 80 brave Americans gave their lives. The men and their lighter-than-aircraft had proudly earned the label, they were dependable.